Hello, in this video we're going to review the chapter 6 and 7 exam. Um, there is a little bit of chapter 7 at the end of this, so make sure you do the homework for chapter 6, and I think there's one homework assignment on that kind of summarizes chapter 7. You want to make sure you do that before you take the test. Um, so what we're looking at here is we have a fifth root that's indicated by the number here. Whoops, I need to put my pin, activate my pin here. Okay, let's see if that's going to work. All right indicated by this number here. Now this is kind of a big number. Uh, it's a little bit more than what I would expect you just to know off the top of your head. But whenever you're dealing with fifth roots, you're looking for a number that when it's raised to the fifth power would equal 1024. So what you could do is go through uh, and start with the number two and then find the first one that gives you 1024. So two to the fifth power is 32, three to the fifth power is 243, 4 to the fifth power is going to be the 1024. And so that's the answer to this, this part of it right here. What number when raised to the fifth power gives me 1024? The answer is 4. Now the negative sign, a lot of times uh, students will kind of overreact to that whenever there's a negative sign in the radical. Um, it's something to be concerned about, but in this case when the root is odd, it just ignores the negative sign. It just lets it pass right through. So the answer here is just going to be negative. When it's an even root, like a square root or a fourth root, then the negative sign causes some issues that we deal with later in the chapter. So, so the answer here is just negative four. All right, let's look at the next example. All right, rewrite without rational exponents. That means we want to put this back in radical form, right? So we're being given this expression as an exponent we want to put it back as a radical. Whenever you have an exponent that is a fraction, it's going to be a radical. So, so let me do it this way. Um, let's undo that. The, the top number is the power that you're taking. So it works just like an exponent. We're raising it to the third power. The bottom number in your exponent is the root that you're taking. And so we have to apply both of these to this particular number 256. We want to raise it to the third power. We also want to take the fourth root. Um, the order, the best order to do that in is to apply the root first, in this case anyways, and then raise that answer to the third power. So you can apply these in whatever order you want. So we'll do the fourth root first of 256, and then once we get that result, we'll raise it to the third power. All right, so again, we're back to fourth root of 256. That's uh, another number that's a little bit bigger than I would like for it to be. It's a little bit out of the range of what I expect you to know off the top of your head. So what you might have to do, again, this is for fourth roots. Now we're interested in what number, when raised to the fourth power, will give me 256. So 2 to the fourth power is 16. 3 to the fourth power is 81. 4 to the fourth power is 256. And so this is equal to 4, right? What number, when raised to the fourth power, gives me 256? 4. 4 does. 4 to the fourth power is 256. And then that, in turn, needs to get raised to the third power. So we're just going to copy that down. 4 to the third power, this is one that I expect you to kind of know off the top of your head. It's 64. All right, next. Rewrite with rational exponents. So this is going in the exact reverse direction. We want to rewrite this as an exponent instead of leaving it in radical form. There's no number written here in the, uh, the crevice here of this radical notation. Whenever the number is missing from that, it's, it's understood to be a 2. It's a square root, and so it's an invisible 2. And so we're going to go in reverse direction. Right? We'll have 10mn. We're going to raise that to the power of a fraction. And the number that goes on top of that fraction is whatever power you had which in this case is the seventh power. And the number that goes on the bottom of that fraction is whatever root you're taking, which is a two. That's a second root, a square root. Um, so, so again, the top number is the power that you had on your expression, and the bottom number is whatever root you were taking, which in this case was an invisible two. And we put that in parentheses because the entire expression, 10mn, is being raised to the seven halves power. All right. Uh, use the law of exponents to simplify. So this this thing is, the, the math formatting on this is less than ideal. We have a to the 3 fourths power times b to the 3 tenths power, and that whole thing is being raised to the fifth power. So this is maybe a better way of writing it, so it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. The laws of exponents 
uh, that we're going to apply here are whenever you have two things being multiplied together, you can distribute the exponent to each factor, to each thing that's being multiplied. So we're going to have a to the 3 fourths power being raised to the fifth power, and then b to the 3 tenths power being raised to the fifth power. And what we do with the exponents, when you have one base with two exponents acting on it, is you're going to multiply these together. A lot of students will just skip. They'll skip writing this part out and just skip to the answer, and that's fine if that's what you want to do. We're going to multiply. Uh, think of this as 5 over 1. So when you multiply these two fractions together, you get 3 times 5, which is 15 on top, and then 4 times 1, which is 4 on the bottom. Here, think of this as 5 over 1, and the 5 on top can cancel out with the 10 on the bottom. So let's go ahead and take care of that first. That's going to leave a 1 up here, leave a 2 on, in the denominator, and then we will multiply these together. So 3 times 1 is going to be 3 on top, and then 2 times 1 will be 2 on the bottom. And you can just leave it as an exponent. They don't want you to write this back in radical form. All right. And so that would be the final answer for that. The thing with exponents is you don't want to have any negative exponents. And if, as fractions, you want to make sure these are reduced as much as possible. And, and they are. Um, all right. So simplify, uh, use rational exponents to simplify this. Uh, so this one is, uh, we may not have to do rational exponents here. Uh, what happens, so for example, this, this eighth root is going to apply to each factor individually. I guess the way you would get that is with rational exponents. So let's just go ahead and do that. This eighth root, if, if we write it as an exponent, so I'm going to take what's in the radical first, put it in parentheses. Writing this as an exponent, the denominator will be an eight because that's the root we're taking. And so the root goes as the denominator. And this whole thing, if you take it as one whole expression, since there's no exponent indicated here as a power, it's being raised to the first power. So the power that we're going to put here on top is a 1. Um, and so, so, so kind of a, the way I think of it is an eighth root is the same thing as a 1 eighth power. Right? And what we're going to do, now that we have it as an exponent, just like we did on the last example, you can distribute this and apply it to each factor inside the parentheses. And so we're going to get 256 to the 1 8th power, c to the 40th power raised to the 1 8th power, and then d to the 48th power raised to the 1 8th power. All right. Now for the variables, this is actually the easy part because we're going to multiply these together just like we did in the last example. So we'll get 40 on top, 8 on the bottom, but 40 divided by 8 is just going to be 5. So we get c to the fifth power. Same thing happens with d. We'll get 48 on top. Think of this as being over 1. And then 8 on the bottom. 48 divided by 8 is going to be 6. And then this one's kind of tough, right? We have uh, 256 to the 1 8th power. That's an eighth root of 256. Uh, so again, that's a little bit out of the range of what we're normally used to dealing with, especially, I mean, the number's not so bad, 256, but the eighth root is not a root we normally encounter. So we'll, we'll just start with 2, 2 to the eighth power. If you check that on your calculator, it actually is 256. So right away we find what number raised to the eighth power equals 256? The answer is 2. And so that would be my final answer right here. Okay. What, what I was going to do initially with this problem that I kind of changed my mind on, is, and what we'll find out later, because of this property, this is an eighth root. It's being applied to each factor individually. So we could have rewritten this as the eighth root of 256 times the eighth root of c to the 40th power times the eighth root of d to the 48th power, and just apply the eighth root to each one individually. And then remember that these will divide, just like they did here. This is 40 divided by 8 which is what we got here. That's how we got 5. This will be 48 divided by 8, which is what gives me 6. So you just divide in those cases. That's a nice shortcut that you can use. So you don't have to convert it to exponents in order to do that. All right. So we're going to kind of take advantage of that property here. The square root of 50, there isn't a single nice answer to this. There is no there is a number that when you square it equals 50, but it's not an easy number to identify. Uh, 
Um, the numbers that are easy to identify are like, you know, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, dot, dot, dot. 7 squared is 49, so we almost have that, right? If it was 49 here, the square root of 49 would just be 7. And then 8 squared is 64, right? So 50 gets skipped over. So there's no single simple answer to this radical, maybe is a better way to put that. So, but we don't just leave it as it is. We do try to simplify this as much as possible. And that means getting as much outside the radical as you possibly can. So what we can do is split the 50 up as something times something, and then use the property that we just talked about to apply the square root to each factor separately. And the, the idea here is that we'll have something inside of one of these square roots that will simplify nicely. So something that I sometimes will have students do is they'll say, well, I could write 50 as, you know, 10 times 5. But that doesn't do us any good. The square root of 10 doesn't simplify. The square root of 5 doesn't simplify, right? So that's not a good way to split it up. We want a number under this radical that will simplify nicely. So the best way to split this up with the square roots here is to do 25 and 2, right? So it really helps to have these numbers memorized, at least up to, I usually suggest students memorize up to 12 squared, which is 144. So if we have that memorized, we know 5 squared is 25. So that's a good number to have inside of a square root because it'll simplify nicely. And when I see 50, that's immediately what I think of is, well, I can get 25 from that. 25 is a good number here with the square root. So the square root of 25 is equal to 5. It just simplifies to 5. The square root of 2 doesn't simplify, so we just copy it down. And so this is going to be our final answer, 5 square root of 2. Now, if you're thinking, I'll just plug this into my calculator, now, some calculators will do this for you. It'll take square root of 50, and it'll write it like this for you. And, you know, I feel like those calculators are doing a little bit too much for my students. But what you don't want is a decimal answer. Math Excel will not accept that. The test will not accept that as a correct answer. You, they, you need to simplify it in radical form and leave the answer in radical form. All right. So this is the same thing, same, pro, same kind of idea. We're going to split this up. And, the, and Math Excel, if you look at the examples on Math Excel, it asks you to, um, you know, do each one separately. Square root of 12, square root of a squared, square root of b. Simplify each one individually and then multiply the results together. My personal approach to this is let's just deal with the whole thing all at once. And we'll go through each one individually, splitting it up into what I like to call a good pile and a bad pile. In the good pile go the things that you can take the square root of and have it simplify nicely. In the bad pile go the things that uh, are just left over after you do that. So for example, 12, I'm going to split that up as 4 and 3. Because I can take the square root of 4, that's going to simplify nicely. And 3 is just the junk that's left over, so I put it into the junk pile or the bad pile. Now for the variables, when you're taking a square root, what you need here in the good pile is the highest power possible that can be divided by 2, because that's what a square root is going to do to the exponent. It's going to divide the exponent by 2. So I want the biggest power possible so it'll divide by 2, and so I'll get a nice answer. So for a, I don't need to split this up. I'm putting all of a into the good pile, because that power of 2 can be divided by 2, so it'll simplify nicely. I don't need to split it up. The whole thing is good. The whole thing's going to simplify nicely. For b, it's exactly the opposite. I don't have enough powers of b to put into the good pile because it needs to be divisible by 2. I need at least b squared here, and I don't have that many powers to work with. All I have is b to the first power, which is not going to simplify nicely with the square root, so I put it into the bad pile. And then what I do, now that I have a good pile and a bad pile, is I apply the square root to each pile separately. Apply the square root to the good pile, apply the square root to the bad pile. For the good pile, I apply the square root to each factor individually. The square root of 4 is going to give me 2. The square root of a squared, again, we're going to divide. 2 divided by 2 gives me an exponent of 1. All right, so a to the first power. The base stays the same. It still stays a, but then we divide the 2s, and that's how I'm getting a 1 there. And then this bad pile just copies down because nothing there will simplify. That's why it's the bad pile. All right, now, this is the final answer, but we don't want to leave an exponent of 1 um, because we can write it without that, right? And so it's a little bit nicer if you just leave it without that exponent of 1. So still 2a, but we just won't write the first power there. So that's the answer. All right, let's try that on another example. It's a little more complicated, right? So one like this. Now, 
The variable part of this, what makes more sense here is to multiply these together back inside of a single square root um, and then simplify, but the numbers are not going to be very nice to us here. 63 times 27, it's going to be huge. So what I'm going to advise is we're going to multiply these back together into a single square root. So I'll have 63a to the 13th b times 27 a to the 14th b to the 12th power. Right. So square roots can be applied individually to each individual factor. They can also be multiplied back together. Right. So this is supposed to be a single square root here. So they can be multiplied. So multiple square roots can be multiplied back together into a single square root. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the a's together. When you do that, you'll add the exponents. So we have 13 plus 14, which gives me a to the 27th power. And then I'll multiply the b's together b to the first power times b to the 12th power is going to give me b to the 13th power. And then for the numbers, I'm, I don't want to deal with too big of a number here. So in fact, I'm just going to leave the numbers separate. 20, uh, 63 times 27. Let's just leave those separate for right now and see if we can work them down from here instead of multiplying them into a super big number. All right, we're still taking the square root here. So what I want to do is split each of these into a good pile and a bad pile. So we'll start with 63. What number, what factor of 63 could I split and put into the good pile? So again, I'm thinking what should go into the good pile? 4, 9, 16, 25, 36. These are numbers that are good to have inside of a square root. So for 63, I can write that as 9 times 7. So 9 goes into the good pile, 7 goes into the bad pile. For 27, same thing, right? I can write that with a 9, so I'm doing 27 now, and then 3 would be left over that goes into the bad pile. For a, I want to get the largest power here that I can take the square root of and have it simplify nicely, which means I want the biggest power that can be divided by 2, because that's what a square root is going to do. It's going to divide this by 2. So sometimes students will say, OK, I'll put a squared here, which does simplify nicely with the square root. But then you're going to have 25 powers of a left over. And that's too many to put into the bad pile, because you can get more a's out of this, right? You can split this up again as a squared times a to the 23rd power, and split that up again as a squared times a to the 21st power. And we don't want to have to do it two powers of a at a time. We want to get the largest exponent out of there as we possibly can, and just do it all at once. So let me undo all of that. And let's just start back over. So what's the largest power I can pull out of this that could still be divided by 2? Right? And the answer is 26. Right. So I can take 26 of these 27 powers of a. 26 can be divided by 2, so that's going to simplify nicely. And I'll just have one power of a left over that I put into the bad pile. So use that same reasoning with b. What's the largest power of b that I can write over here where the exponent's still divisible by 2? The answer is 12, right? You have 13 to work with. I'll put 12 into the good pile because that can be divided by 2, and I'll have one power of b left over that goes into the bad pile. All right. So now we apply the square root to each of these separately, the good pile and the bad pile. And for the good pile, I'm going to apply the square root to each one individually, and it's all going to simplify nicely. Square root of 9 is 3 times the square root of this 9 will also be 3. When I apply the square root to the 26, it's going to divide that power by 2. So I'll get a to the 13th power. Do the same thing to the b. It'll divide that by 2, and I'm going to get b to the 6th power. And then this is the bad pile. Nothing there is going to simplify. So I'm just going to copy it down. But I'll go ahead and multiply the 7 times the 3 together. So that'll be 21 and then AB. And the last thing I could have done already, but I waited. Maybe you guys already have done it. We should multiply these 3s together so we get 9. 9A to the 13th power, B to the 6th power, times the square root of 21AB. And so that's simplifying that square root as much as we possibly can. All right. OK, let's look at the next example. So this one, you're dividing, but it works very similar to the last problem. It's a fourth root on the top and the bottom of this fraction. We can rewrite that as a single fourth root and divide these two things together inside of a single radical. Why we want to do that is to it allows us to cancel some things out, and it'll make it simpler, and then hopefully we can simplify it more easily from there. 
right? So by having these together inside the same radical, we have this fraction together inside of a single radical, we can start reducing, canceling things out. So this 10 on the bottom cancels out with 810 on top. So dividing that by 10 really is just gonna knock a zero off the end of that. So we're gonna end up with 81. Here we'll subtract the exponent. So we have 13 minus one, which gives me x to the 12th power. And here we'll subtract the exponents. The base stays the same, it's still y. 13 minus five gives me eight. And we're still taking the fourth root of this. Right? But notice how nicely that simplified. It simplified so nicely, it's not even a fraction anymore. Right? It simplified to a nice ordinary expression. And this one, we actually don't even have to split up into the good pile or bad pile. It's all good stuff. The fourth root of 81 is three. The fourth root of x to the 12th power, we'll divide that by four, right? Whatever the root is, that's what you wanna divide by here. So 12 divided by four is gonna give me x to the third power. And do the same thing with y. It's a fourth root, so we're gonna divide this exponent by four. Eight divided by four gives me two. So I get y to the second power. So since all the exponents were divisible by four, which is the root I'm taking, and the 81, we can take the fourth root of 81 completely, right? We don't have to split it up because the whole thing simplifies nicely. We just simplify it without having to split it up into good pile and bad pile. All right, I hope that made sense. All right. This one, we're going, we're going to go in the opposite direction. We're going to take this single square root and split it up and apply it to the top and bottom separately. And you might say, well, why are we doing the opposite thing here? We just do whatever it takes to get the thing to simplify. And if we leave it as a fraction, this isn't going to simplify very nicely. Nothing reduces, nothing cancels out. So we have to approach it from the other angle. Let's see what happens when we split it back up and apply the square root to the top and to the bottom. Right? Here, we could have started simplifying the top and the bottom. Right? These do actually simplify, but you also notice that if I put these back together inside of a single radical, things will cancel out, things will reduce, and I'll have a much easier time of simplifying after I reduce things first. So that's why we went with this approach. Let's put it back together inside of a single radical first, see what happens, see what we can simplify, right? Okay, so back to this one. The denominator simplifies very nicely, right? This is a six, the root is a square root, so we're dividing it by two, and it divides nicely. We get x to the third power. Um, on the top here, uh, this doesn't quite simplify as nicely, so we're going to have to split it up. Good pile, bad pile. I apologize that I set my window and i almost cutting off the directions here, so I apologize for that. And I'm kind of out of room here for, with what I want to do, but what I want to do is split this up. Good pile, bad pile. 36 doesn't need to be split up because it's all good, right? The square root of 36 will be 6, so we'll put all of that into the good pile. Let's see if I can write it. Now, but y to the fifth power, five is not divisible by two. So that's not going to divide nicely. So I need to split up the y. Put the largest power possible over here that can be divided by two. So I'm going to put y to the fourth power, right? I have five to work with. I can put four into the good pile. The four will be divisible by two. So that'll simplify nicely. And I'll have one power of y left over that goes into the bad pile. Right. Then we apply the square root to each pile separately. Sorry, you can't see that. Let me try that again. I'm um, right there. All right, and so we'll simplify the square root of 36 gives me six. The square root of y to the fourth power, because it's a square root, we're gonna divide that power of four by two and we get y squared. And then the bad pile, the square root of y just copies over, right? It's not gonna simplify, so it just copies over. All right, and so this will be our final answer. All right, that's simplifying it as much as we can. It can't be reduced in any way, so that's the best we can do. All right, uh, so here we're asked to add, simplify by collecting like radical terms if possible. So we have five square root of 108 plus nine square root of 27. All right. So the 108 and the 27, let me point this out at first uh, to begin with. These are not like terms, right? They don't have the same radical, so they are not like terms. In order to be like terms, they have to have the same exact radical part. Not just being square roots, but the numbers have to be the same also. So the, we can't combine these together the way they are right now. But what we can do is simplify. We can simplify each of these radicals. So for 108, we want the largest number possible that I can take the square root of. I'm not honestly sure what that is off the top of my head. So I'm thinking nine, but that might not be the biggest number that would work. Right, so if we split it up with nine, so let's take 108, 
Sorry, I didn't write that very well. Let's try the 8 again. Take 108, split it up as 9, and then divide 9 into the 108. All right. And we're going to get 1 up here. It leaves me with a 9. Subtract. We get 18 left over. So it's going to be 12. So 9 and 12 is a way you could split up 108. And that is kind of nice because we can take the square root of 9 and we get 3. But then we have to look at the 12 that we have left over and, and, and realize, well, the 12 could be split up again, right? I could split up 12 and get another perfect square out of that. I can write that as 4 times 3, and 4 is also a good number to have in a square root. All right? So if I put those together, I see that I have 9 and 4 that both should go into the good pile. Together, that gives me 36. All right? So I'll put 36 here times, and then we'll have 3 left over that goes into the bad pile. All right? You apply the square root to each one separately. The square root of 36 will be 6. The square root of 3 copies down. And then don't forget about this 5 that we had here to begin with. It's still being multiplied to this, right? That's what it was doing to begin with. It's still being multiplied here. And now that we have a number outside the radical to join it, those two numbers will get multiplied together, and we get 30. 30 square root of 3. This one's a little bit more straightforward. The 27, we want to split that up as 9 and 3. There's really no other consideration there. Let me try writing that 3 again. Right. Then we apply the square root to each number separately. Square root of 9 gives me 3. This square root of 3 copies down. Then we bring the 9 down, which is still being multiplied to that. So 9 times 3 gives me 27. Square root of 3. We're still adding here, so let me copy the plus sign down. And now we actually can combine these together because now they're like terms, right? This is a square root of 3. This is a square root of 3. They're the same exact radical. So I can combine these together as like terms. The way you do that is just like if these were x's here. You have 30x plus 27x. So you add the coefficients together. 30 plus 27 gives me 57. And if these were x's, it would just be 57x. You do the same thing with the radical. The radical part just stays the same. It's just going to be square root of 3. right? You had 30 square root of 3's plus another 27 square root of 3's. That gives you 57 square root of 3s altogether. But it's still square root of 3, just like it would be if it was a variable. It'd still be x, right? All right, so we get 57 square root of 3. All right, to multiply, we are going to distribute. So we'll distribute the square root of 5 here in this case. So we'll get square root of 5 times 8 square root of 2 minus square root of 5 times 2 square root of 25. And I messed up there. I didn't write the, the 25 there. Times 2 square root of 25. All right, now I should have really paid attention. I just jumped right into doing this problem, doing this problem here. Um, the square root of 25 can be simplified, right? Square root of 25 is just 5. I should have done that first. And then we get 5 times 2, which is 10. So let's just go ahead and do that now, right? Square root of 25 is just 5. And then 5 times 2 is going to give me 10. So this will be the square root of 5 times 10. This is going to be the square root of 5 times 8 square root of 2. Now, what I do with these, when I start having things like this multiplied together, is what, what I tell my students is the numbers outside the radical will multiply together, and the numbers inside the radical will multiply together. So we have a 1 here in front of the square root of 5. 1 times 8 is still going to be 8. And then square root of 5 times the square root of 2 multiply together to give me the square root of 10. So it'll still be inside of a square root, but you multiply those together, and that's how you get 10. Here, this number is outside the square root, so I'm going to write that first. And then I'm going to write the radical second. And there's nothing to multiply together at this point, right? Uh, there's only one number inside of a radical. There's only one number outside the radical. So we just copy those down, but we're going to put it in this you know, more um, you know, conventional order, which is the number goes first, the radical goes second. And this is where we have to stop because these are not like terms. This is a square root of 10. That's a square root of 5. They're not the same. So I can't combine them together. So this would be my final answer. That's the best we could do with that. All right. This one we're going to have to foil. And this time I don't. there's nothing to simplify ahead of time. So we're just going to jump right into it. So you do first, outer, inner, last. Right? So multiplying the first two terms together, we get square root of 10 times 8 square root of 10. The outer terms we're going to get plus square root of 10 times 1. The inner terms we get plus 1 times 8 square root of 10. 
and then the last terms we get plus one times one, which of course is just going to be one, but I'll just write it out just like I did the other ones. Now here, there's a shortcut that's going to really come in handy later when we do some examples later. We have a square root of 10 here being multiplied to another square root of 10. And this, is, this only works for square roots. When you multiply a square root to itself, the answer is just whatever's inside that square root. So for example here, square root of 10 times the square root of 10, now you could multiply those numbers together inside of a single square root. 10 times 10 is going to give me 100, but the square root of 100 is just 10, right? So it's sort of a shortcut that you could just jump right to that answer. Whatever number's inside the square root, that's what the answer ultimately equals. So the square root of 10 times the square root of 10 is just going to be 10. That's still getting multiplied by 8. So 10 times 8 is going to be 80. Plus, here, square root of 10 times 1, well, what happens anytime you multiply by 1? It, it stays the same, right? It's just going to be square root of 10. Plus, same thing happens here. 1 times this thing is just going to stay the same. Right? Sorry, I'm trying not to. I have this button on my pen that acts as an eraser, and it's hard to avoid accidentally pressing it when I'm writing. So try that again. 8 square root of 10. Plus 1 times 1 is 1. Now we combine like terms. The 80 and the 1 are like terms. So we add those together. We get 81. And then the square root of 10 and 8 square root of 10 are like terms because they both have the same radical. This is 1 square root of 10 plus 8 square root of 10. That gives me 9 square root of 10 altogether. Right? The radical part doesn't change. And this is as far as you can go with this because these two things are not like terms. They don't have the same radical. They can't be added together. So that's as much as we can simplify that. All right, rationalizing the denominator. So what we're trying to accomplish here is having no radicals in the denominator. To get rid of this radical, this is where that rule I just told you comes in handy. If I, wanna, if I want this square root to go away, I can make it go away by multiplying it by another copy of itself. Because square root of 3 times the square root of 3 ultimately just equals 3, and the square root is gone. It's out of the picture. All right. And so what we're going to end up getting on the bottom here, the 5 just gets copied over. It's now multiplied by 3, right? because the square root of 3 times the square root of 3 just gives me the 3. And so I end up with 15 on the bottom. I'm really sorry. I'm really bad at drawing arrows, I feel like. Um, all right. If you multiply that to the bottom, you got to multiply the same thing to the top. And so we'll multiply these together. The 6 will stay outside the radical. It has nothing to multiply to. But the 5 and the 3, those are two numbers inside of the radicals. They will multiply together to give me square root of 15. And so I'll have 6 square root of 15, which you have to reduce. So anytime you have an answer that's a fraction, you want to try to reduce it. These are both divisible by 3. So I'm going to divide a 3 out of the 6. It leaves me with a 2. Divide a 3 out of the 15. It leaves me with a 5. And so we get 2 square root of 15 over 5. Now you might say, well, what about the 15 and the 5? Right? You could divide a 5 out of both of those. You can't because the 15 stuck inside the radical. So you can't cancel out something outside the radical with something inside the radical. So it's kind of, they're cut off from one another. So that's the best we're going to be able to do. All right. Now this one's a little bit more difficult. We have two square roots we're trying to get rid of at the same time. Unfortunately, you can't just multiply by the square root of 3, for example, because that would get rid of this one, but then you'd still have this radical. And if you multiplied something to that radical, it would distribute and get multiplied back to this, and it would just kind of flip-flop back and forth. You'd always have a square root there one way or the other. So the trick to getting rid of both of these radicals at the same time is to multiply by what's called the conjugate, which means you keep the same two terms, square root of 5 and square root of 3, but instead of subtracting them, you're going to add them together. So that's called the conjugate. You just use the opposite sign in the middle, but the two terms stay the same. So when these get multiplied together, we'll have square root of 5 minus the square root of 3 times the square root of 5 plus the square root of 3. You're going to FOIL. So first will be square root of 5 times the square root of 5. Using our shortcut, that's just equal to 5. right? Then we'll have square root of 5 times the square root of 3. Multiply those together, you get the square root of 15. The inner terms, it's negative times a positive, which will be negative. Multiply these square roots together, you get another square root of 15. And then, again, negative times a positive will be negative. 
square root of 3 times the square root of 3, our shortcut tells us that's just equal to 3. Right? Whenever you multiply a square root to itself, you just get whatever's inside of that square root. And then we combine like terms. Well, the square root of 15s cancel each other out. So those square roots go away. And so there's no square roots left over. Right? We just have 5 minus 3, which is 2. Right? So that's what we're going to end up getting in the denominator here is a 2. All right. Since we multiply that to the bottom, we have to multiply the same thing to the top. And so we're going to have negative 8 square root of 7 times, we, use, we need to use parentheses here, square root of 5 plus the square root of 3. All right. Now before we distribute that 8 square root of 7, which we, we, we're going to have to do here in a minute, but before we distribute it, we can actually use this as a factor to cancel out with anything in the denominator if there's something to be canceled out. And there is in this case, right? We can divide this by a 2, and it leaves me with a 1. And this 8 is outside the radical, so we can also divide that by 2, and we have a 4 left. And so we'll have negative 4 square root of 7 times the square root of 5 plus the square root of 3. Now we'll go ahead and distribute. And of course, we have a 1 on the bottom, which we don't need to write anymore. So it's not a fraction anymore since that 2 canceled out. We'll go ahead and distribute that. And so we'll have negative 4 square root of 35 minus 4 square root of 21. All right, so again, I multiplied. There's, no, there's nothing for the 4 to multiply to, so we just have the 4 copy over, and then the 7 gets multiplied to the 5 to get 35, and then it multiplies to the 3 to get 21, right? because those are both inside the square root, so they multiply together. All right, so that is rationalizing the denominator when there's two terms, two square roots. All right, so I'm sorry the equation is getting cut off at the top there. I'll rewrite it down here. We have the square root... Actually, I guess I could do this. Uh, let's see. Uh, we'll go back to this, and maybe I'll just drag this down. There we go. Okay. So now you can see it. Go back to using the pen. Because I wasn't sure if the square root went all the way to the 1 or not. I couldn't quite tell either. So I have the square root of 5y plus 1 equals 7. Right? And the square root goes all the way over the 1. All right. So we're solving an equation involving a radical. So something else you'll learn about radicals is that they cancel out exponents of the same number, right? So a square root cancels out a power of 2, and vice versa. A power of 2 will cancel out a square root. Uh, a cube root cancels out a power of 3. A power of 3 can be used to cancel out a cube root. So here we have a square root. We want to solve this for y, which is stuck inside of this square root. So I need to get rid of the square root here. I can cancel out a square root by raising it to the second power. All right, let me try that again. Raise it to the second power. And if I'm going to do that to the left-hand side, I have to do the same thing to the right-hand side, of course. Right. So what's going to happen here is that power of 2 directly cancels out with that square root, and, they're, and then they're both gone. Right? They cancel each other out, and they disappear. So what I'm left with is 5y plus 1. That's all that's going to remain on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, 7 squared gives me 49. And now I can solve this for y since there's no radical in my way, and I solve it just like a regular old you know, equation like we learned way back at the beginning of the course. Right? We subtract 1 from both sides, so we get 5y is equal to 48, and then we divide by 5 on both sides. And try to reduce if possible, but that doesn't reduce, so we'll just leave it as is. It's 48 over 5. And that's the solution to this equation. All right. So as I mentioned in the, the previous example, we have a cube root here of x plus 9 equals 2. What cancels out a cube root is a power of 3. So if I want to cancel out this cube root, I need to raise it to the third power. If I do that to the left-hand side, i got to do the same thing to the right-hand side. And then again, the cube root and the power of 3 directly cancel each other out. They, they both completely disappear. And what I'm left with is just this x plus 9. That's inside the radical. On the right-hand side, we get 2 to the third power, which is 8. And now I solve for x by subtracting 9 from both sides. And I'll get x is equal to negative 1. And that's it. That's the solution. All right, so power 3 cancels out a cube root. All right. Uh, same thing here, except this time the equation that results is going to be a little more complicated. We get x minus 5 equals the square root of x minus 3. 
So we'll do the same thing we did previously to cancel. We can't solve for x while it's stuck in the square root. So we'll cancel out the square root by raising it to the second power. If we do that to the right-hand side, we have to do the same thing to the entire left-hand side. So make sure when you're applying these exponents, it's not you know, piece by piece, it's the whole thing, right? Everything on the left-hand side at once gets raised to the second power and everything as a whole on the right-hand side is getting raised to the second power. And on the right-hand side, the power of two cancels out with the square root. And all I'm left with here is the X minus three. On the left-hand side, it's a little more complicated what we got to do. You cannot distribute the power of two here. This is not the case where you can distribute. What you have to do is take the X minus five and multiply it to itself twice. So write it out, x minus 5, multiply to itself twice. When you write it like this, then it's clear what has to be done. You have to FOIL. Right? So you're going to get x times x, which is x squared, x times negative 5, which is negative 5x, negative 5 times x, which is also negative 5x, and negative 5 times negative 5, which is positive 25. The right-hand side didn't change, so I'm just going to copy that down. We'll combine like terms, and we end up with x squared minus 10x plus 25 equals x minus 3. So what we have on our hands here is a quadratic equation. We, we, we were introduced to these kind of equations in chapter 4. We dealt with some of these equations in chapter 5, and again, we're dealing with them in chapter 6. The process, so hopefully you've had enough practice, you're getting the hang of these. Whenever you have x squared, the process for solving that is to get 0 on one side and then factor the other side. Right, so I need to zero out the right-hand side by subtracting x from both sides and adding 3 to both sides. Let's get rid of both of these. And we're going to end up with x squared minus 11x plus 28 equals 0. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, that button keeps getting in my way when I try to write. Okay, now we factor, and so we look for two numbers that multiply to 28, but add to negative 11. And those two numbers will be negative 7 and negative 4. We set each factor equal to 0, so we get x minus 7 equals 0, x minus 4 equals 0. Then we solve for x, and I'm just going to jump to the conclusion here, which is we'll get x is equal to 7, and x is equal to 4. Now, you need to be very careful about this. Um, because on the test, if you type, you know, we didn't do anything wrong at this point, right? Everything we've done so far has been correct. And these are the two answers you're supposed to initially get. But if you type both of them into Math Excel as your solutions, Math Excel is going to say you're wrong and you won't get any credit for this problem on the test, which I wouldn't want to be the case. Something that we probably should have been doing already, but it becomes definitely more relevant here when you have a variable outside the radical, not just inside the radical. You have to check your answers to make sure these work in the original equation. So let's go ahead and check x equals 7. All right, so let's plug 7 in for x. We'll get 7 minus 5 on the left-hand side, and then we'll get the square root of 7 minus 3 on the right-hand side. And when you simplify each of these, 7 minus 5 gives me 2. And on the right-hand side, we get 7 minus 3, which is 4. The square root of 4 is also 2. So 7 works out perfect, right? Nothing wrong with 7. Let's check x equals 4. Oh, come on. All right. Uh, that's, I, I can't live with that. Let's uh, try that again. All right. Let's try x equals 4. Plug that into this equation. So again, I'm just plugging 4 in for x over here. I'll get 4 minus 5 on the left-hand side, and then the square root of 4 minus 3 on the right-hand side. When you simplify this, 4 minus 5, and this is where the issue is going to be, we get negative 1 equals the square root of 4 minus 3, which is positive 1, and those do not equal out, right? This will be negative 1 on the left-hand side. This will be positive 1 on the right-hand side. They're not the same. So 4 actually doesn't work in the original equation, so it's not actually a valid solution. And so only 7 works in this equation. That's the only solution here, so that's the only number we should type into the box. All right, so make sure you're checking your answers on these square root equations. All right, so this is going to be probably the most time-consuming, difficult problem on the test, the equation with two square roots. All right, so what we're going to do, 
All right, and of course it's the variable z, which takes a little bit more time to write. Um, so z plus six. The first thing you're gonna do is get rid of one of the square roots immediately by squaring both sides. And you can do this as long as one of the square roots is already by itself. Now, in some equations that might not be, it might not be set up that way, but for this equation, it is set up that way. This square root is already alone. So we can go ahead and cancel it out by raising the entire right-hand side to the second power. That power of two is gonna directly cancel out with that square root. If we do that to the left-hand side, we have to, sorry, I'm saying the wrong directions. If we do that to the right-hand side, we have to do the same thing to the left-hand side. Raise the entire left-hand side to the power of two. So on the right-hand side, everything works out hunky-dory, just like we're used to, like we've, you know, like we had happen in the previous couple of problems. We just get z plus six. But on the right-hand side, this, sorry, I keep getting my directions backwards. On the left-hand side, this power of two does not cancel out with this square root because the three is in the way. And there's just nothing that can be done about that. You're stuck with that three. You're not gonna be able to cancel out this square root immediately. So what you're gonna have to do, just like we did in the last problem, is take this expression, multiply it to itself twice. So you'll have three plus square root of z minus nine times three plus square root of z minus nine. I'm sorry, my handwriting's so bad. All right, and when you write it out like that, hopefully you can recognize this is another case where you have to FOIL. It's two terms here, two terms here. So we're gonna FOIL, multiply the first two terms together. Three times three gives me nine. Multiply the outer terms. Positive times a positive is positive. We'll get three times square root of z minus nine. Right? Just, you know, nothing really happens there. You just put the three first and the square root second. For the inner terms, you do the same thing. It's positive times a positive, which is positive. We have square root of z minus nine times three. I'm just gonna put the three first and then the square root second. And then the last one, and this is, this is where this shortcut is the biggest help. Positive times a positive is positive. Square root of z minus nine times another square root of z minus nine is just gonna be z minus nine. If the square root goes away, you just get whatever's inside the square root as your result. Whenever you multiply two square roots that are the same together, right? So if you multiply two of the same square roots, you just get whatever's inside that square root as an answer. This is still equal to z plus six, right? And so we're gonna combine like terms here. So the nine, and this is really kind of nice, and the minus nine. I don't know if that's gonna happen for you every time, but I'll, I'll take it here, right? Those just cancel each other out. And then these combine together, so we're gonna get six because they have the same radical part, they are like terms. Three plus three is six. The radical part stays the same, so it'd be z minus nine. And then I'm just gonna copy down the plus z here, equals z plus six. All right, and this could have gone a little bit worse than it's going. This actually works out pretty nice. Now I need to get rid of this square root. And the way you cancel out that square root is to get it by itself. So I'm gonna isolate this square root next, which means all this other stuff around it has to go because squaring it doesn't do any good until the square root is by itself first. So I'll subtract the z from both sides. And this is this is great, the z's cancel out. And so the z's cancel out from the left-hand side, but they also cancel out from the right-hand side. And if that doesn't happen, that's when you have sort of your worst case scenario. If you still have a variable left over after this, you're gonna end up with a quadratic equation. You have to solve that, and it's just gonna be a little bit more work. This is gonna be a little bit less work. We'll end up with six square root of z minus nine. That's all I'm gonna have left over on the left-hand side. The z's all cancel out, and we'll just have six on the right-hand side. And then I'll cancel out the six. It's being multiplied to the square root. So to cancel it out, I'll divide by it. Divide by six on both sides you get the square root of z minus nine equals one. Now I can cancel out this last square root by raising both sides to the second power. Now that power of two on the left-hand side directly cancels out with that square root. So we get z minus nine, that's all that's gonna be left over there. And this is kind of weird, one squared is still just gonna be one. Right. Now we solve this for z by adding nine to both sides and we get that z is equal to 10. Now you can't 100% trust that solution because whenever your equation has square roots, it's possible the answers you're getting aren't correct. So these are really unreliable solutions. We have to check them to make sure they actually work. 
um, they're, they're, they're reliable in the sense that if anything is going to work, it has to be this. It's either z equals 10 or there's no solution. But we have to investigate that by checking to make sure 10 actually works. So let's plug in 10 up here. We'll get 3 plus the square root of 10 minus 9 equals the square root of 10 plus 6. So we'll get 3 plus the square root of 1 here equals the square root of 16. The square root of 1 is 1. The square root of 16 is 4, so we get 4 equals 4. So 10 indeed works, so that is the solution. If 10 didn't work, we would say there's no solution to this equation. And like I said, I think that should be the, the most difficult problem on the test, in my opinion. You, you might disagree. Maybe there's some other ones that you find more challenging, but that's a tough one. All right. Now here we're going to be dealing with imaginary numbers. So we have negative square root of negative 45. Anytime you have a negative inside of a square root, that is going to give you an imaginary number. The proper way of mathematically processing this is to separate the negative sign from the number. So I'm going to write this as negative 1 times, oh, let me try holding the pen a different way, negative 1 times positive 45. Then I apply the square root to each factor separately. And the square root of negative 1 is the very definition of what the imaginary number is. That, that is i. That's what i is equal to. And then the square root of 45 just copies down. And this negative sign here is just going to copy down too. It's not going to do anything. It's just You just have to keep copying it down with your answer. Now now that the negative sign's out of the way, so, so let me say this. The shortcut I always use, I don't usually write it out like this. Most people don't. They say if there's a negative in the square root, it becomes an i outside the square root. You just jump to the conclusion, right? This negative sign is going to give us an imaginary number outside the radical. Now that that's been processed, we can deal with this number here like we were doing earlier. We're going to split it up. And 9 keeps showing up in a lot of these problems here. So this is going to be 9 times 5, right? We apply the square root to each number separately. So let's go ahead and continue up here. We have negative i square root of 9 times the square root of 5. The square root of 9 is 3. The square root of 5 copies down. The conventional thing to do is to put the i after the number but before the radical. The radical always goes dead last because if you put anything after the radical it can be confusing. Like if I put an i here you might wonder was well, that inside the square root or is that outside the square root? It's hard to tell. So we always keep everything in front of the radical to make it clear what's inside the radical and what's outside the radical. So i is going to go before the radical, but we like to put it after the number. So we're going to put it right here. And then the negative sign always stays out in front of the whole thing. So this is the proper way of writing the answer. All right. Here we have complex numbers where the imaginary number is already present. We don't have to find it. I'm sorry, my handwriting is getting bad here. Maybe I need to take a little bit of a break before I finish the video. Um, Maybe I'll take a break after this problem. So, so this is a plus sign here. So here we're being asked to subtract. Now keep that in mind. It's a subtraction problem. It is not a multiplication problem. And that is the most common mistake students make with this particular problem. Everybody starts off on the right foot. They take the negative sign and they distribute it into the parentheses. That is the right thing to do. And you get negative 7 minus 5i when you do that. The mistake students will make is that they'll keep the, they'll keep the parentheses here, and then they'll keep this in parentheses, and then it looks like it's multiplication. So then they foil, and that's where you go down the wrong path. It should at no point ever become multiplication here. This is a subtraction problem. All we should be doing is combining like terms. There should not be any foiling or any multiplication of any kind. If you wanted to keep the parentheses around, what the proper way of writing this would be to have a plus sign between these two parentheses. It never becomes multiplication. If you get rid of the minus sign, then you leave a plus sign behind. And you're still trying to just combine like terms. The safe thing to do here is just not write the parentheses. After you distribute the negative sign, drop all the parentheses because they're no longer mathematically necessary, and then combine like terms. Right? So this is what it should look like. Distribute the negative drop the parentheses, and this is what you get, and then combine like terms. So we'll do the numbers first. We have 2 minus 7, which will be negative 5, and then negative i minus 5i. You treat i like a variable. That's going to be negative 6i, and that'll be the final answer there. 
All right. Here's where you're being asked to multiply, and here's where we're going to do FOIL. But the directions say multiply. So only when the directions say multiply should you ever be doing any kind of FOILing with these kind of problems. So we'll have 5 plus 7i times 7 plus i. So to multiply, it's two terms times two terms. We're going to FOIL. First, multiply the first two terms together. 5 times 7 gives me 35. Then you multiply the outer terms together. 5 times i gives me plus 5i. Multiply the inner terms together. 7i times 7 is going to be 49i. So we're treating i just like we would treat x. We treat it just like a variable for now. Right? And then we'll have 7i times i. The most common mistake students make on this problem is they'll just write that as 7i. Or they might even write it as 8i because they're adding them together. But we're multiplying here. And i times i should be i squared. That's a really important detail you don't want to leave out. So what we're going to do is combine like terms. 5i plus 49i gives me 54i. 35, I'll just copy that down. But the i squared, we rewrite as negative 1. Right? Because i is equal to the square root of negative 1. If you square both sides, and you square the left-hand side, and this is supposed to be a parenthesis here, square the right-hand side, the power of 2 cancels out the square root. You get that i squared is negative 1. So that's just something you should know. You should know both of these. All right, so whenever i squared pops up, you always substitute it for negative 1. So we're going to get 7 times negative 1, which will be negative 7 when we multiply those together. And now these are like terms. So we combine the 35 minus the 7, and we get 28 plus 54i. And that will be our final answer. All right, so the final answer should be another complex number. OK. All right, so now we're finally to the Chapter 7 material. I think we just have a couple more problems. I'm just going to try to um, go ahead and keep working through it. So we want to solve this equation. This is another quadratic equation, but this one you can't solve in the way that we were solving quadratic equations previously. You can't just get 0 on one side and factor the other side for a lot of these problems. If, if, if you can, then go ahead and do it that way. That's going to probably be the easiest way to do it. Here, the, the best thing for us to do is just solve this for x by moving everything to the other side. And the first thing that has to go is this power of 2. What cancels out a power of 2? A square root. Right? We just talked about that earlier in the video. A square root will cancel out a power of 2. If I apply a square root to the left-hand side, I have to apply a square root to the right-hand side. Right? The square root cancels out the power of 2. They completely just disappear, and all I'm left with is x minus 5. But something you have to remember when you're using this, um, when you're when you're solving equations in this way, whenever you apply a square root to both sides of an equation, you have to put a plus or minus on the on one side of the equation. Typically, you put it on the side that's opposite the variable. Right now, the reason we're doing this is because technically, the square root of x squared isn't just equal to x like we usually write. It's actually equal to the absolute value of x. But we don't want to deal with absolute value of x minus 5 here. In lieu of using the absolute value, we put a plus or minus sign here instead, because that's what the absolute value would lead to. Having an absolute value would lead us to have both a positive and a negative solution that we'd have to look at. Um, so that's the rationale behind it. I know that's a pretty lousy explanation for it, but that's the reasoning why we have to do plus or minus. All you have to remember is, when I take the square root of both sides of an equation, put a plus or minus on the right-hand side of the equation. Right. Then we're going to simplify this. So the square root of negative 16, remember what we, we, we just did an example with this situation. The negative sign comes outside of the square root as an, an imaginary number. All right, so let's process that first. And then with the 16 here by itself, the square root of 16 is going to be 4. So we get i times 4. So we get x minus 5 equals plus or minus i times 4, which we're going to write as 4i. All right, so we're going to multiply these two things together, and that's what I'm writing up here. And now I can solve this for x, finally, by adding 5 to both sides. And whenever you have a plus or minus involved, it's pretty conventional to put any, any terms that are being brought over 
from the left hand side in front of the plus or minus. So the final answer here that we're going to write, we'll have positive 5 first, then we'll have plus or minus, and then we'll put the 4i. All right, and that'll be the final answer. Let me indicate here that there are actually two solutions. Um, and uh, so that would be the final answer. Now I'm a little bit, uh, okay, yeah, so this is kind of weird, this second part. You know, when I saw this on the test, I was like, okay, whatever answer we get here is going to have some kind of square roots involved. So if it asks for approximate answers, you just plug it into your calculator and get decimals for it. But there's no way to plug this into our calculator. There's nothing to plug into our calculator to compute. We just have whole numbers here. So we're actually going to select option B for this one. There are no approximate solutions because there's no way to plug this into our calculator. There's no square roots to uh, simplify or calculate. So if we had like something like 5 plus or minus the square root of 2, you could plug this into your calculator to get approximate solutions. But you can't do that with the imaginary numbers, and you can't do that with just whole numbers. Um, so they're already exact. There are no approximate solutions. There's no way to approximate it um, because they're exact. And yeah, so I'm going to stop saying that. All right. So that would be the answer. Okay. So here we want to solve for x. There's two ways you could do this. Now, if you look on Math Excel at the question help, like if you're doing the practice exam, it might have you completing the square, but I'm going to advise against using that technique, and I would suggest just using the quadratic formula. I mean, first see if you could factor it, right? We have x squared plus 18x plus 4 equals 0. You might try factoring first, but at this point in the test, I doubt I'm going to give you one here that could be factored. You'd have to find two numbers that multiply to 4 and add to 18, and that's just not going to happen. So your backup plan, if you can't factor it, is to use the quadratic formula, which is this formula here. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, the whole thing over 2a. So you plug in a, b, and c. In this case, a is equal to 1, b is equal to 18, c is equal to 4. Plug those numbers into the formula, so we get x equals negative b, which is 18, plus or minus the square root of b, which again is 18, squared, minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is 4. The whole thing divided by 2 times a, which is 1. Right? And that's the solution. That's what's, that's what's amazing about the quadratic formula. It just instantly solves the equation for you. The thing is that it's too good to be true, right? It sounds too good to be true. It is too good to be true because you can't leave your answer like this. This is a big mess. We have to simplify it. And so let's get started on that process. We'll have negative 18 plus or minus the square root. 18 squared is 324, I believe, minus 4 times 1 times 4, which will be 16. The whole thing is divided by 2 times 1, which is 2. And we'll take that last step to simplify the square root part of this. 324 minus 16 is going to be 308 over 2. Now we need to try to simplify the radical. So 308, I'm guessing, will split up somehow. I want to say 4 is probably going to work. And 4 is a good number to have inside of a square root. So that's something that we're going to have to do. 4 goes into 308. Let's see, 4 goes into 30 seven times. Sorry, let me try writing that again. Whoops, hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. 4 goes into that. Oh, now it won't let me erase. Uh, it won't let me undo, I should say. So let me erase the 7. All right. Um, right. 4 goes into 30 seven times. A remainder of 2. Uh, and then bring down the 8, so we get 28. 4 goes into 28 another 7 times, so we get 77. So I, I would recommend analyzing this number to see if it could split out again with something that you could take the square root of, but it doesn't, because the only way to rewrite 77 is 7 times 11. And neither one of these numbers work nicely with a square root, so there's no point in splitting them up like that. We'll just leave it as 77. And so I'm going to rewrite 308 um, as... Let's see, plus or minus. Rewrite it as 4 times 77. And then I'm going to apply the square root to each one separately. The square root of 4 gives me 2. 
and then the square root of 77 is just going to copy down because it won't simplify. The plus or minus will still be in front of that, and in front of that will still be the negative 18, and on the bottom we still have the 2 that I failed to write the first time. All right, now we can reduce this. Since we have a number outside this radical here, this 2 will divide nicely into both of these things, and so we'll get negative 18 divided by 2, which is negative 9, plus or minus, when the 2 divides into this, the 2's are just going to cancel out, and we'll have square root of 77. Now this is one that if they asked us to approximate, we could. We could plug this into our calculator, and we get two different answers. We get one answer where we use the plus sign, and then one answer where we use the minus sign, and we could get decimal answers as approximations to this. Thankfully, they're not asking us to do that. They ask us to leave it in radical form, so we're just going to leave it like this. All right. Let's see, I think this might be the last one. So uh, thankfully we're almost done. A little bit over an hour. I'm sorry it went a little bit long. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to use the quadratic formula. But before we can use the quadratic formula, we have to get it equal to 0. So we're going to subtract 12x to the other side. And we'll put it in order from highest to lowest power. So we're going to have x squared minus 12x plus 52 equals 0. You might try factoring first, because if it can factor, that will definitely be an easier way to solve it. But we'd have to find two numbers that multiply to 52 and add to negative 12. We're not going to find two numbers that do that. And so we're going to just have to use the quadratic formula. So negative b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. I don't know why I'm putting parentheses there. Just put a. All right. So a in this case is equal to 1. b is equal to negative 12 c is equal to 52. Let's plug those numbers in. We're going to get x equals, now when b is negative, you need to be careful. The formula has a negative sign, and then we're plugging in negative 12 for b. Plus or minus the square root of negative 12 squared minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is 52. The whole thing divided by 2 times a, which again is 1. And then we'll simplify. Double negative makes this a positive 12, plus or minus the square root. Negative 12 squared, even though the 12 is negative, when you square it, it still comes out positive. So it's going to be positive. Sorry, I'm hitting the button again. Uh, gosh, I'm, and my writing's getting terrible. Let's try all that again. We're going to get positive 144. Minus 4 times 1 times 52 is going to be oh, 208, I believe. All right, over 2 times 1, which is 2. All right, so we'll continue up here. We're going to have x equals 12 plus or minus the square root. This is going to be negative, which means we're going to get an imaginary solution here. Um, I'm trying to do all this in my head. So far, I've been OK, but now I feel like I'm uh, stumped a little bit. So this will be 50, 64? I think it's going to be 64, which is actually kind of a nice number to have there, over 2. So let's see if we can do both of these things at once to save us some writing. The negative sign is going to come outside the square root as the imaginary number, and then the square root of 64 is going to be 8. So we're going to have 8 from the 64, and then i from the negative sign. So it's going to be 8i. We'll still have the plus or minus, we'll still have the 12 in front of that, still being divided by 2, but now we can reduce this by dividing the 2 into each term separately. All right. So I'll divide the 2 into the 12 and divide it into the 8, so we get x is equal to 6 plus or minus 4i. That'll be our final answer for that. All right. So that concludes the review for the chapter 6 and 7 test. Good luck on the test. If you have any questions, if I'm your instructor, I'd be happy to answer them. Just send me an email, and we can set up a time to meet either online or face-to-face -face if you're in town. And um, good luck with the test.